This is your reminder that the BBC has yet to address the consistent transphobic leanings in its news coverage. And while the team behind Doctor Who is not connected to this in any way, since this is a BBC-owned property, I'm going to keep pointing it out until the problem gets resolved. Links in a pinned comment below if you don't know what I'm talking about. I'll stop saying it when it stops being a problem. Previously on Council of Geeks. I, oh, am I going to have to do a separate thing on why I think the bi-generation is good and a lot of the arguments I hear against it? don't make sense to me. I don't know if that's something worth doing or not. Let me know. And now on Council of Geeks. Well, you asked for it. Okay, couple of videos back, I said that if there was enough interest, I would do a video talking about my thoughts on bi-generation specifically, why I think it works, and more specifically than that, addressing some of the common complaints that I see and hear against it. Because a lot of them don't make a ton of sense to me, um, or at least not enough to make me not like it. So. A lot of this I did already talk about when I did my actual review of The Giggle. Feel free to check that out there. But this will not be strictly reiterative because there I gave my explanation for why I like it. But because I put my review out before reading anybody else's reaction, I didn't know what the common complaints were. And now I do. And this is not strictly supposition. I did my best to try and supplement what I was already seeing uh, out and about in the world. I did a poll both on the community tab here on my YouTube channel as well as on Twitter, and the results were more or less comparable. Twitter was a little harsher in terms of not liking the by generation, but not by all that much, and that also isn't super surprising to me. If you're voting on the uh, thing on my uh, community tab, then you probably watch my channel and may have heard me make my arguments already or are in general just a little bit more positive on Doctor Who, whereas putting it out in the wild on Twitter, yeah, probably snag a bit more negativity. Um, but both seemed overall fairly consistent, at least in terms of what got most votes, second most votes, and then third most between it's good, it's mid, it's bad. So I also asked for people to leave their comments about what they did or didn't like about it. I especially wanted to hear from people who didn't like it. And I've gone through those replies. I'm not going to address every single thing because there were some things that like cropped up and I, I didn't quite know what to do with, largely because they were like one-offs, like one person worded something in a way that like, well, I haven't seen it that way before, but if I included all that, this would be forever. So I have narrowed it down to the ones I was seeing repeatedly. Um, so if you have uh, an issue with it that I didn't address, that's probably why. But uh, in any case, why don't we start with a little bit of a reminder of what happened in the Doctor Who episode, The Giggle. Well, the 14th Doctor being played by David Tennant, who had previously played the 10th Doctor. This is the first instance of an actor coming back and playing a new incarnation of the Doctor again. What? And he, he gets killed effectively, more or less, he gets injured in a way that would kill him, and then that kicks off regeneration. That's how regeneration has usually worked. And what happens in the moment is instead of him being replaced by the next Doctor, who we already knew was going to be Shudi Gatwa, that casting had been announced, instead, they kind of split, and we get what's get what gets referred to as a bi-generation, which is something that shouldn't be able to happen, but seems to largely be an influence of the presence of the Celestial Toymaker, who is the villain of it. Him just being around is bending a lot of rules, and that gets brought up in a couple of things, and it's been suggested is going to be part of leading things into a more supernatural direction in the upcoming season. Um, but I'm not going to get too speculative on that. Uh, in general, I don't do that anyway, and I'm definitely not doing that here. But in any case... By generation... <laughs> I have bi-generated. <laughs> There's no such thing. Bi-generation is supposed to be a myth. That has never happened before. And what that meant was for the final stretch of the episode, Shudi Gatwa and David Tennant were sharing the screen together, which, like, multi-doctor stories have been a thing 
But in a regeneration story, no, no, that that's new. And at the very end, basically, Shurigato told him, hey, you need to chill. You have got a lot of issues you need to deal with. And I know you will because I'm okay and I come after you. Peter, I'm fine. I'm fine because you fix yourself. We're time lords. We're doing rehab out of order. But you need to go off and sort yourself so that I can be okay. He's saying you need to stop. I don't know how. And David Tennant's 14th Doctor effectively retires. And he goes and lives with Donna Noble and her family. He does have his own TARDIS, but he's relaxed. He's not rushing about saving the world. He's just having a happy ending of a calm, retired life. Something that no doctor has had before. And the way that the show is kind of structured, no doctor could have unless you were going to end the show altogether. The doctor can't stop. The doctor can't retire uh, if, if you want to keep the show going. So that's what happened. What did I like about it? Well, it's worth noting at this point, because this was also something that was mentioned a lot in the comments, on paper, this is not a good idea. I, th I think this is a mess of an idea. We've had too much like stuff getting messed with in weird ways that hasn't really gone well. I mean, that was a lot of Chibnall's era, the previous showrunner. But like this, on paper, I, I hate this idea. And actually, honestly, I'm still not sure it's a good idea as far as the concept in and of itself. Why I came around on it was what it enabled to happen. And most specifically, that it enabled a doctor to have a happy ending. Because as I said, the format of the show kind of means that can't ever happen if the show's gonna keep going. So this was something that was never in the cards, that a doctor could retire, relax, just be happy, take care of himself and those around him. That was never going to happen. This choice, this bi-generation enables that to happen. And I'll point out in my particular case, it doesn't matter to me that it was Tenet in particular. I think, at least for why I like it, this would have worked just as well had it been any previous Doctor that is the, where the actor is still around. I think this would have been just as powerful and just as effective if it was Eccleston, if it was Matt Smith, if it was Peter Capaldi. I mean, it couldn't really be Jodie Whittaker. She's the one who just... Although, that would be odd. Like, regenerate into, into herself. Screw it, I'll put that on the table as well. Like, I think that just this idea of any doctor being able to retire is a wonderful thing. It's a powerful story, and it's one that it never occurred to me we could even get, and I like that we've now had it. I don't ever wanna see it done again. This was something for me to appreciate as a, oh, that's what that feels like. To have a doctor retire and be happy, this is what that feels like. I didn't think I'd ever get to feel that. Oh, that's nice. That's what I really love about it. And for me, as a bonus, we actually get more time with Shudi Gatwa than is standard from most incoming doctors in a regeneration story. But hold on to that thought. I'm going to circle back into it when I start addressing some of the common complaints. But that is the main thrust of why I really like it. Now, there's one other thing that's worth noting. This is not the first time that regeneration has been done weird. This is kind of the first time where regeneration has been done weird in the modern era since the show's revival in 2005. Since then, regeneration has been very consistent in terms of how it has been handled and how it's been depicted. Um, you know, it's always the yellow lights and the ah, and then the doctor is wonky for a little bit. Usually the TARDIS explodes. That was something that really needed to stop. I'm glad they didn't do that in this one. Um, but it's been incredibly consistent. That consistency is actually kind of new. Uh, there was not a hard set of rules for how regeneration worked in the classic era, and some of those were weird. 
the fourth doctor's regeneration into the fifth doctor, Tom Baker into Peter Davison, is notoriously weird and wonky because it's this whole thing with this other being, the Watcher, that's been seen across the story who's kind of like an omen of death, not literally, but metaphorically within the story. And when the Doctor regenerates, the Watcher joins with him and they become the next Doctor? That's never happened before and that's never really had a proper explanation. But it's worth noting that weird stuff with regenerations has happened. So it's not completely unprecedented to do something different. Something weird. That, I guess, will start to lead us into me addressing some of the common criticisms and complaints that I saw. And like I said, most of these I I don't agree with, and I'm going to try and be fair. I don't want to be mocking, and I don't want to come across like I think people are foolish for having these opinions. Your opinion is your opinion. But I am going to explain why those don't quite land right for me in most cases. First up, there was a notion that a few people put forward of David Tennant fatigue. In a way, I kind of get this, but in another way, I kind of don't. So I do get this insofar as he continues to be the face that is most frequently the front of things being pushed. Um, So if you look outside of the show, yes, he hadn't been on the show since the day of the Doctor uh, during Matt Smith's era. That was a multi-Doctor story. But You know, he's frequently the face of things for comics, for novels. He's done more than a fair bit of stuff with Big Finish and audio adventures and things like that. And a lot of the merch and the references and when people reference Doctor Who, it's more liable to be him. And there is kind of a certain ubiquity to that. So on the one hand, I do kind of get starting to feel like Tennant is becoming the face of a show that really should be far, far bigger than him. And being a little bit annoyed with that. I do get that. I'm a little bit confused as to why the bi generation in particular sets that off, as opposed to when Whitaker regenerated into him. Because I would think that, like, that would put you off the entire three specials. Star Beast, uh, Wild Blue Yonder, and The Giggle. Because it kind of did for me, or at least prepped me to be put off. Because, and that wasn't because I was tired of Tenet in particular. It's because I've always thought bringing back an old actor to play a new regeneration was a bad idea and an unhealthy thing for the show to do from a creative sense and like just being able to move forward because it's so looking back. Ultimately, I turned around on it, not just because of the giggle, but because across those three specials, I really appreciated what the show did with the idea of him coming back with an old face. And I think that, uh, I would say to the least extent in the first one, the Star Beast, but across the three to varying degrees, telling stories and taking advantage of the fact that he is back and doing things in a way that wouldn't have been done or wouldn't have played the same if it was a completely fresh face for those specific stories. So uh, again, not to make this about Chibnall, but to sort of make the comparison, a big thing that really annoyed me about Chris Chibnall's era when Jodie Whittaker was the doctor was him doing things. And then I would go like, okay, I don't think that's a good idea, but I guess I'll see what he does with it. And then he did nothing with it. So, I mean, just having something where like, that's not a good idea, but I'll see what they do with it. And something was actually done with it. And I ended up liking the things done with it. Yeah, that does it for me. But coming back to what I was saying before, if you're tired of Tenant, were you put off from all the specials? Because people are giving that as a reply for disliking the by generation in specific, which strikes me as a little odd, except for one other connected thing that did come up a lot, which is people being to some degree frustrated or concerned that There's another doctor still hanging around, and that it's Tennant in particular. Now, this is one of the ones that I think has uh, some of the most nuance to it. And it also rides most of them, not all of them, but most of the comments along these lines have a massive overriding assumption that he's going to come back. Like, he's hanging around. He's on Earth. Of course he's going to show up again. Of course they're going to bring him back. Now, I have the opposite assumption. I am assuming that they aren't going to bring him back. I don't think they will. Now, 
that is my assumption clashing, clashing with the assumption of people who are frustrated at the idea of like, well, they're going to do something else with him. You just know they are. And you might think, okay, well, agree to disagree. You have competing assumptions. I do have a little bit of precedent on my side, though, which is this kind of happened with David Tennant already. If you've seen series four, he almost died there and he managed to um, continue going on. But there was a weird thing that went on because he got his hand chopped off before. It's it's not worth explaining the whole thing. But his hand grew a rest of him and that became known as the Metacrisis Doctor, who was ultimately left in a parallel dimension completely sealed off with Rose Tyler. Now, I assumed when that happened, oh, they're going to bring him back eventually. The Metacrisis Doctor, in particular. They're going to bring him back eventually. Of course they are. Why would they do this if they're never going to bring him back? They never did. Even when David Tennant came back, it was never the Metacrisis Doctor. He didn't come back for David the Doctor. He didn't come back for this. There was an existing David... Like, they could have... I mean, they chose not to, but they could have had for some reason, the Metacrisis Doctor return, and that's who's in the specials, and we don't even see who Whitaker regenerated into, and this kind of is happening, like, almost in parallel, or while um, Shudigatwa's Doctor is recovering from the regeneration, or whatever. Like, they could have brought him back. They didn't. They did this instead. So, I'm not taking it as a given that this that he's going to be brought back because I think this is a presumption on my part but I think the reason the metacrisis doctor never came back is because his story was done ultimately he was created to give Rose Tyler a happy ending and to allow her to have a doctor with her in in this other dimension where she was not going to be able to come back from and that meant that both her story and the Metacrisis Doctor, the function he was made to fulfill, their story is done. There isn't a reason to bring him back that doesn't undo the ending of that story. And I think that Russell T. Davis, RTD, the showrunner who wrote both of these things, understands that. And I think his understanding of that is why he won't bring back this Doctor either. Not like for a story. It is possible that maybe he'll at some point come back to like tie off the end of his regeneration, which, okay, that'll actually be the next thing. But just to, just to wrap up with this real quick. So in general, I, I think part of people's sense of tenant fatigue is uh, an acceptance of the inevitability that, well, you know, he's going to come back. They're going to bring him back. Like, but his story's done. And if people are going to make a logistical argument of like, but yeah, but if Earth is in danger, he's not just going to sit in the garden. It's like, yes, he is. Yes, he is. Because the doctor is going to take care of it. And that doesn't have to be him anymore. Now, it would be in the best interest of maintaining that story for, at the very least, throughout Shudigato's run, for um, whatever things threaten Earth in specific to be manageable and not seem like, well, there's going to be massive collateral damage even if the uh, even if the current doctor, if Shudi Gatwa's doctor can handle it. Um, best not to go too big scale um, because then it would become a question of, wait, is the other doctor really not going to step into this? Because that could get a little dicey, but in my overall opinion, in terms of what the purpose of this is, like, yeah, he is just going to stay. He's not going to jump in and help. It's not his job anymore. His story's done. But as I said, the one way I could see him coming back is if they want to tie off his regeneration. But we don't even know if that's necessary, which kind of brings me to the next thing, which is people complained about how by generation worked that was not really fully explained. Exactly what it is and how it worked and the full mechanics and logistics. Some people were annoyed that they still don't really get it. Now, for people hung up on the logistics, I don't really have a counter argument to that other than a matter of personal preference. Because for me, I understand it as well as I need to for this story to work. Um, that being that this doctor, whatever goes on in his life, is still, even as he's existing in parallel with the Shudi Gatwa doctor, this is all in the Shudi Gatwa doctor's past. Because he had that line, we're time lords, we're doing rehab out of order. So 
even as they exist in parallel in time, that whatever the 14th Doctor goes through is already something that the 15th Doctor remembers experiencing and gets to benefit from, i.e. calming down, sorting himself out, and all that. Which is why, again, as a benefit to all this, the 15th Doctor gets to just be happy and joyful, which we haven't really had in the modern era, because initially with the time war and then just in general how things have gone, there's always been something heavy weighing on the Doctor. The Doctor hasn't gotten to just be like, like the closest was the 11th Doctor, Matt Smith. He was silly, but like there was still something burdening him in the back of his head. The 13th Doctor, Jodie Whittaker, like she wasn't great at making connections. She didn't connect with her companions well because she was always holding back to some degree. Shedding all the baggage is another thing that is enabled by the by generation. But again, the full logistics of, so wait, does the 14th Doctor, is he going to regenerate again? Or are there now parallel tracks? Short answer to that is no, at least not by how it's explained. Because again, with what little we get, 15 is still what comes after 14. There isn't an alternate 15. So how that works fully logistically, does it mean that when the 14th Doctor eventually dies of whatever, however that happens, he just remerges with 15? Or he just dies and vanishes and that regeneration energy is just somehow transported or just it doesn't even need to be? I don't know. But for my purposes and for what I get out of the story, I also don't really need to know. But I also know that people who are more into lore and into rules and into the logistics, yeah, they are hung up in not knowing exactly how this worked and not knowing exactly how it's going to play out. I get it. I just don't share it. I am going to circle back on the idea of David Tennant still being around. I will say that my optimism and my enjoyment on this, as I mentioned, is on the assumption that he isn't ever going to come back. If they do bring him back, like, to participate in a story or good grief, heaven forbid he, like, take over for a special or a stretch of a series, yeah, I'm going to be real annoyed. Because th what that would do, if it happens, and I don't assume that it is, in fact, I assume very, very sharply that it won't, but that would kind of undercut Shudi Gatwa's doctor. And that notion of undercutting, shortchanging, or stealing the thunder of the 15th doctor, of Shudi Gatwa's doctor, is another one of the major recurring things. This is another one that I don't really get. Because people cite the bi generation as, well, Shudi Gatwa's doctor doesn't get his moment to shine. He had to share the screen. He had his thunder stolen by David Tennant, and I, I don't get this one. And I'll explain why. The first is, just by comparison, he gets so much more screen time than has ever been afforded to the incoming doctor in a regeneration story. You want to know how it usually works? Usually, in the modern era, the regeneration happens, new doctor gets one scene, maybe only one line. Oh, Berlin. And then it ends, and you have to wait to see them again later. There's not a lot of thunder to steal there. The thunder, the actual highlight, the spotlight, is in their first full story as the doctor, which for Shudi Gatwa would be Church on Ruby Road. The incoming Doctor having this much screen time, that's unprecedented. He gets way more time to shine than any incoming Doctor ever has. I got way more a sense of who he was in his time because of that in that story. Generally, what I get out of the regeneration, like it's one line, like I can't gauge your personality off that. Like, at all. I can't gauge your personality off of new teeth. That's weird. I can't gauge your personality off of still not ginger. I can't gauge your personality off of I have new kidneys. I can't gauge your personality off of, oh, brilliant. I can't gauge your personality off of I know these teeth. But I can gauge a personality off of how much time we get with Shudi Gatwa's doctor. There was one person, I was sent this TikTok, 
And I'm, I'm not going to clip it because this is a much smaller account and I'm not trying to call this out. But one specific thing he said, and I kind of, I kind of lost it a little bit. I'm not going to show you the clip because I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to put a target on anybody's back, but I am going to quote it. This is his time. This is his moment. Imagine if they'd done that with Matt Smith or Peter Capaldi. Motherfucker, they did do it with Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi's first full story as the 12th Doctor was Deep Breath. At the end of Deep Breath, Matt Smith's Doctor appears in a time-displaced phone call. And you know what? People at the time were ticked. Not everybody, probably in percentages of the same people who think the bi-generation is bad, but some people were really ticked saying that that stole the thunder from the incoming doctor, stealing some of the spotlight from Peter Capaldi. And there, while I don't agree, I do think there was a much better case to be made there because his first full story, that is his time to shine. And the Matt Smith doctor nudged in on that a little bit. But you know what the other thing is? Yeah, people were ticked, does anybody still complain about that? No, clearly people don't even seem to freaking remember that that happened. And it's also worth mentioning to compare it to classic because yeah, it. I feel like a lot of fans are only comparing it to modern day. Like let's go back to classic. Most new incoming doctors didn't even get a line of dialogue. You just saw the face change. That was it. Maybe a sentence or two. What's happened? Change, my dear. And it seems not a moment too soon. And like the weird wonkiness of six into seven, but that's for complicated reasons that I'm not going into. But this amount of screen time on the in the regeneration story itself, this has never happened before. And that's what I mean when I say I don't get that people think that just because he was sharing the screen with Tennant, it somehow stepped on his moment. I got so much of a sense of him, far better than I've ever gotten of any doctor on their first appearance because he got more time, he got to do more, he got to say more. I just, I don't, I, I don't get this complaint. I, I, again, I'm not gonna tell you you're wrong. I just don't get it. Another thing that I saw was some people saying that having another doctor around, even if he doesn't come back again, sort of gives ammo to the people who are going to say, well, Shudigatwa isn't the real doctor. The real doctor is in a garden with Donna. And I would see sort of a general resistance to the idea of giving ammo to people who probably just don't want a black doctor. And the thing is, a few years ago, I would have agreed. I was against the idea of giving like a sort of spin-off or miniseries to the Eighth Doctor, which some people were clamoring for after the Night of the Doctor, for this exact reason. I felt it would split the fan base. Unfortunately, what I've learned in the time since then is the fan base is already split. And it's not like if the 14th Doctor wasn't around, these people were suddenly going to accept Shudi Gatwa. And while I understand the gut instinct to not give ammo to bigots, the thing is, they're gonna come up with something. No matter what we do, if they don't like that a black person was cast as the doctor, they're gonna bitch about it, whether it's this way or some other way. So I don't believe it's a good idea to hamper storytelling in a vain and futile attempt to shut these people up, because they never will. Yes, some people may point to the 14th Doctor as a reason to not accept the 15th Doctor, but they're still making a conscious choice to not accept the 15th Doctor, and I do not believe they would have if this didn't happen. So f them. Now there's one other major thing um, and one minor thing tied to it that got brought up a fair few times. And that had to do very specifically with disliking what Russell T Davies, what RTD said about by generation in, I believe it was the commentary track on the giggle. And what it basically amounts to is he said that in that moment, by generation happened for every doctor in the past as well. And people have been, who are aware that he said that, have largely been pretty vocal that they think that's a terrible idea. And to be clear, I agree. But I'm gonna repeat something that I've said before, and I'll keep saying it as many times as I have to. Commentaries are not canon. Interviews are not canon. Behind the scenes comments are not canon. The show is canon. So unless that ever gets depicted on the show proper, it's not canon. What he shared with you was, for all intents and purposes, his fan theory of what happened to every other doctor. I don't think that is 
ever going to get confirmed. And before, before some of you pedants, oh, but it is confirmed because that explains tales from the TARDIS and why the doctors are older. Hmm. That is not required for tales from the TARDIS to work. You listen to some of the lines delivered by some of those doctors. Believe it or not, I woke up in here myself. I think it's a memory. <laughs> oh, time marches on, Perry, even for a time lord. Time streams are funny things. And some I regenerate, and others I don't. It's all a matter of perspective. There's just nothing indicating that that is why this is going down the way it is. Besides the fact, it's debatable whether Tales from the TARDIS is canon. Because... Generally, the thing to remember with Doctor Who canon, there is a ton of ancillary stuff. There's the novels, there's the comics, there's the audio dramas, there's Tales from the TARDIS, there's the weird little bumper things in the advertisements for box sets of the classic era. Those all tie into the lore and characters and some of them even advanced plots and whatnot. If it isn't in the main show, the extent to which it is canon amounts to it's canon until the show says it isn't. Basically, anything that is not the show itself could be canon. And we have had some uh, confirmation of some aspects of this being canon, but that doesn't canonize everything. But unless it's in the show, it's a thing that you can take into account or you can disregard. And I give no weight whatsoever to RTD's commentary track comment about this affecting all doctors. Now, if that very idea you find so offensive that somehow ruins the thing for you, like, I I guess that's the thing that could happen. Um, and I have nothing, you know, to say about that. Is it a bad idea? Yeah. Is it ever going to come up? No. And I think some people have kind of connected to that, have like gone with this idea that some, for some reason, RTD wouldn't kill his darling like he's unwilling to kill Tenant. And again, the people making that complaint would also cite the Metacrisis Doctor. And yeah, I guess, but he did still retire him. Like, speaking as somebody who has that complaint of like, you won't kill your freaking character or you won't let them leave. And I have that complaint about Clara Oswald, which is a Moffat issue. Now, I've had that complaint about some characters and I just don't get the same energy. I don't get the sense of, I love this character too much and I can't let them go. What I get the sense of is I want to do something that'll work best if we have this character. And I want to give an ending that no other doctor can have. So granted, that's kind of a vibes thing. And that doesn't um, necessarily negate people's feeling that like, well, he just, he just wouldn't let him die. And again, that kind of factors into the David Tennant fatigue thing. And I suppose the one other thing I'll mention is I do wonder with, and I kind of went off on it, but the thing with the stepping on Shudy Gato's moment, I wonder if some of that is residual frustration from stuff that happened at the tail end of Whitaker's era, i.e., the announcement that RTD was coming in and that Shudi Gato had been cast happened before Whitaker's last season even aired. And a lot of people at the time were annoyed by that. It's worth remembering that while that did uh, happen as an official announcement, it happened so quick and so loose. It was just like announced on a red carpet. I feel so firmly that they did it that way to get ahead of a leak because Doctor Who ha cannot keep secrets. Like... The only way for something with this big a fan base to be able to maintain secrecy is to shoot the way Disney's been shooting a whole bunch of the Marvel and Star Wars stuff, like in that fully locked off set. I don't even know what it's called. What is it, the volume? Whatever it is. It all looks like garbage, by the way, Disney. Stop using that. I know you're trying to get your money's worth out of the thing, but stop. But unless you have a completely locked down set, and which Doctor Who, even with Disney money behind it, cannot afford to do, stuff's gonna leak out. Like, we knew that Wilf was going to appear. He's literally only in one scene of those three specials, but that still got out. It still leaked. So I don't think that initial announcement of um, RTD coming back and Shooty Goth was casting was uh, something that 
was meant to step on anybody. I think it was done to get ahead of a leak. But I do still get that there was bitterness about that. And then, you know, realizing that Tenant was coming back. And even though I held for a while, like a really strong feeling that like no, Tenant, they're not going to have her regenerate into him. Even when, when like all the rumors were flying about, you know, he's coming back and all this stuff. I'm like, they're still not going to do that. And, you know, they did. So they kept, to a certain extent, um, certain aspects of it under wraps. But I think a general sense of a lot of this era was this is stepping on the end of Chibnall and Whitaker's era. And I wonder if there's some carryover into the Gatwa uh, run that people are like, oh, you just keep stepping on everybody else's thing. And that, to me, just seems like misplaced frustration. I don't know. That's that's the one other aspect I'll I'll give as far as that goes. But overall, while I understand where some of these come from, and some of them, like, it's it's a matter of a difference of how you approach things. Like, if you don't, if not knowing the logistics bother you, fair. I have no counter to that. If you're just tired of Tenant and you couldn't even enjoy the specials because of that, fine, fair. But most of the rest of these. They are either based on faulty assumptions, like the assumption that, well, they're going to do more with it. He's going to come back. Like, I really don't think he is. And I may be wrong about that. And if I am, I'll be annoyed, and it'll actually spoil my enjoyment of the, of the by generation. I'll cop to that right now. But for somebody as cynical as I tend to be, I'm going to be optimistic on that one. I think it's done. And I don't agree that it stepped on Shudigatwa's moment. I don't agree that it ruins things or that it messes up regeneration any more than regeneration was already a loosey-goosey mess in the first thing place. I guess, overall, it's just something that I get why people don't like the idea. I don't like the idea. Still, even, I don't like the idea. But they did something with it that I really liked. Now, if you don't like what it did with the buy generation, that also would be a reason to probably not like it, because if I didn't like the result of what happened because of the buy generation, I probably wouldn't like it either. But I do. So, even as I'm going in and saying, you know, I'm going to take apart these arguments against it, like, none of this is objective. This is something that happened to land well with me, and I keep seeing arguments from people who it didn't land for and kind of cocking my head at a lot of them. So I just wanted to address that. Thank you for encouraging me to make this. I hope you enjoyed it. What are your thoughts on all this? Whatever they are, drop something down in the comments. Let's talk about it. I'm sure I'll get some furious rebuttals from people who uh, say I didn't address their concerns or that something about one of my uh, things that I pointed out is somehow wrong. I'm sure it'll be very spirited. Just be polite. But uh, even if you uh, don't want to do that, like, share, subscribe, those are lovely. If you really want to help me out, Patreon helps me pay the bills, enables me to do this as my living. Don't worry too much about it, though. What I really want you to remember is that you are beautiful, you are valid, and you are loved. You are the council, and I'm just running the meetings. And until next time, this council is adjourned. Now to thank my highest supporting patrons, Robin Moore, Zubin Lutfola, Goddess Elida, Oliver B, Tarak, the thing that goes doink in the anime, Fare For It, Ulrich Bogdan, Loki Eris, Mer Melinda Walters, <laughs> Jen, on DK808, Becky Sparks, Renabilax the Poodle, Tracy Scrabbit, Angry Casper, Dave Hall, White Barish, Rosalind Bennett, Toku Bluhuvian, Pau Barabajago, and Meriji. Thank you for your support and for keeping me and these guys fed. What are you doing? <laughs>